Hi, thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me back there? No. No. Even higher. Hi, how about that? Is that better? I spent decades making my voice lower. <laughs> lower. Um, I'm here because um, my cousin set this up and I didn't really know why. Um, but probably also because I'm one of the co-founders of Cisco. Um, and after being fired by the same person who fired Steve Jobs. <laughs> I regard that as one of my lifetime achievements. Um, I started Urban Decay and now I have a um, good size, at least for an organic humane farm. I have a farm and I'm busy building a national franchise um, of organic, humane, sustainable, fast food restaurants in the US. So I suppose that's why I'm here. And I gave Misa a whole list of possible topics, and she picked the one that I find personally the most goring, <laughs> probably the one that you would find the most interesting. Um, to me, this stuff is kind of, um, duh. But maybe, maybe it's not, so if it gets boring, just ask something really weird. And we'll make it unborn. Um, so I was asked to speak about how to know whether your brilliant idea is a good business. And I thought it was good to start first with what is not a business. Um, a lot of people, I think especially women and especially Europeans, are really into social responsibility. And that's great, okay? It's just not a business. All right, business is about profit. I think the best idea, um, I give all my money to animals. Um, so if you make a lot of profit, then you can go be socially responsible. What I don't really think usually works is to be socially responsible and then try to make money. Okay, they're, they're very different things. And another thing I'm gonna talk about are the imaginary markets. People delude themselves that because they need something or they think this is a great idea, everybody else does, um, but there's only one of you and you've probably already bought. And I've seen a lot of people hypothesize that they have the greatest thing going and it's really kind of all in their head. So imaginary markets. Um, personally, I like to start businesses because of tantrums. Um, does anybody know how to translate tantrum into Swedish? <clears throat> it's what your child does when they yeah. melt down mm -hmm. and they really, as, as we all say in the South, they pitch a hissy. They pitch a real big hissy and they lay on the floor and they, they beat their hands and feet and scream. That is a tantrum. Okay, I, I personally like the tantrum idea for business. Um, Cool ideas, um, oh, I should say that tantrums belong in places where there is no access to ready money. All right, if you're gonna have a tantrum, lock yourself in a closet, have the tantrum, and then when you feel better, go back and have your business. Um, the next thing is a cool idea. Uh, you know, cool is a taste thing, right? And if everybody thought the same thing was cool, there would be no uncool people, right? So then you wouldn't have cool people. So cool ideas are not usually a business idea either. Um, and I've had a number of friends who were very odd, like I am, I'm very odd. I like that, I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with my nerdity, okay? I'm, I'm a nerd, I like that. Um, but there aren't very many of us, and so I've had a number of friends try businesses that would appeal to people just like them. The problem is, is that there are about five people just like them. And it's, you know, unless you're selling things like planets, I think it's very hard to make a good business out of five things. Um, if one more person comes up to me and says, oh, I have this really cool app that does something, I will probably have to kill them. Um, you know, I think if it's, I've, I've always said that recently, um, if there's a page for it on Wikipedia, it is not a good business idea. Okay, if somebody has already got it and it's on Wikipedia as a discussion, I think it's not a leading edge idea.
but still people consider that it is. And then I think there's a good class of things that have really good reasons why no one has done them. Okay, build a rocket to go to the moon comes to mind, but then Elon Musk already made a lot of money, okay, when he builds his rockets to go to the moon. So I'm not sure that that's a good business idea. Um, I want to talk a little bit about social responsibility. Um, if you're trying to make a business where, say, none of your customers have any money, uh, that's very hard. Okay, if you're trying to sell things to like subsistence farmers, or actually any farmers, no farmers anywhere have any money. Um, or the other thing is, Cisco actually got started because Stanford was being really unreasonable, and we had used public money to develop the internet, and Stanford just said they didn't have to let anybody else use it. And of course, all of us who were good nerds said, wait a minute, that's not fair. So that was the business that was simultaneously a tantrum and social responsibility, and I could sell at least five of those, and all of my, all of my customers were nerds. So I wouldn't take anything I said too seriously. But it, it turns out that there's, there's a, a, a lot of other stuff under, underneath that. And I think one of the things that people who are very socially responsible forget is that the market really doesn't care about your good intentions. Okay, there are very few people who are market-driven by good intentions. They're market-driven by everything else, like, uh, do I want it? Is it cool? Does it make me look cool? Um, does somebody have it? But none of that has to do with the mindset of the person who actually produced the product. And as a way of underscoring that, I will just say, if it were true that social Good, good social intentions, social responsibility made for good business, so many nasty people would not be successful. Okay, I mean, you know, you have to, you have to look at, you know, like the founder of Facebook and um, the founder of Oracle, and all of those are just really nasty people. And if, although I did hear Bill Gates the other day, and he's, he came across as, I think marriage has improved him. He came across as very nice and very reasonable. He's, he's, Bill, Bill's grown up. Um, but uh, um, Larry hasn't. Uh, so I would just say that if social responsibility were a good business idea, so many nasty people wouldn't have a whole lot of money. Um, other things are family, and I probably half of you will leave the room on this, but it's okay. Um, I don't believe in the family-friendly business. I believe in the business-friendly family. And I think the idea that you can start a business and have a good work-life balance is absurd and self-delusional. <laughs> it is just wrong. Okay, you either want a business or you want a work-life balance. And if you want a work-life balance, you get a paycheck from somebody else who takes the risk. And if you think about it, the people in our parents' generation, they had a good work-life balance, but only because the wife had the life and the man had the work. Okay, so that's where that balance was, that the wife tried to keep some semblance of a life, and every once in a while the man would drop in and say, oh, are these my children? Wow, they, they're really big. Um, and that's how people were successful, and to think that you can have a family and you know, spend all of this quality time with your partner and your children I just think is really a whacked idea and goes really under the heading of self-delusion. Um, maybe there are some people who can do it. I don't know anybody. I, it ruined my health. It ruined my marriage. Um, I'm sure that my cats would tell you that you know, I was a terrible parent during that time. A lot of times those kitties were home all by themselves for hours and days even. So I think that if you want to have a life, you should decide to go work for somebody else. These are very tough words, but you know, I think it's good to set expectations up front. Now, business is something else, and it talks about trade, trading, com you know, commerce. What it really doesn't say is money. Business is about profit, and business is about money. Family is not about profit. Nobody can tell me that children are good price performance investments. They're just not. Social responsibility is not a good price performance investment, but business is, and that's what makes business, at least theoretically, a little bit different. 
Um, social responsibility. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. If your target audience is basically, they have no money. Okay, this my cat wrote this book. You see, that's my kitty right there, How to Take Over the World. But unfortunately, pets don't have pocketbooks. Okay, they, and she didn't sell very many, I have to say. It was a good book. I didn't know she wrote it, but there it was. Um, and so if you're trying to sell to pets, for example, they don't have wallets or credit cards, thank God. Um, or if you're trying to sell to people who are doing socially responsible things, like caring for abandoned animals, or students, or musicians, or artists, um, the unemployed have no, no expendable money, okay, right? People who do social work are usually pretty much as poor as the people that they're helping. Um, students, musicians, and artists have self-selected themselves into a group not to have money, all right? And people who have taken jobs in dead-end industries, which I would say are telephone operators, farmers, and map makers are not going anywhere financially. Um, and I would say unemployed within the nonprofit sector, which was Cisco. We sold originally to universities, but I'm going to explain that that was more of an accident. Okay, it was just happened to be at that point, as the man who was later the CEO said, we were the lunatic fringe. And you found the lunatic fringe at that point in the universities, but that didn't mean that those lunatics weren't going to go out with really huge six and seven figure salaries out into business and do exactly that same lunatic thing. Cisco made its money because of the lunatic, the nerd, the nerd network, I call it. Um, the imaginary market. I have known people who <laughs> hypothesize that there are markets where there basically nobody exists, like people who aren't born yet, um, have more disposable income than Bill Gates, um, and I think the big one that I see are a whole lot of people that are supposed to know that you have a really good product. In fact, you have the best product. No doubt about it. People are immediately going to see that your product is what they should buy regardless of the price point of the competition or the amount of competition in the marketplace. That is truly an imaginary market. Okay? That does not exist. And I think one of the things that people who are trying to get out of the mainstream nine to five job market do a lot of lying to themselves, and I call it and other drugs, lying to yourself and other drugs. Um, never lie to your lawyer, never lie to your doctor, and I just don't think self-delusion is a good idea. You should be really tough on yourself and really challenge yourself to make sure that you're not coming up with imaginary markets and that you really are trying to make or sell something that has to do with people who actually have wallets and credit cards and are of an age to use them. Tantrum. Um, although I will say that all of my businesses have started with what I finally, fondly call tantrum, um, they were really good business ideas except the last one. And I will say the last one was the one that I founded because I had money and I could, and I could right or wrong. It turns out that in English, all of English literature ignores somewhere between two or 3,000 women authors and 10 or 15,000 books that were published in the long 18th century. And so I start about collecting these books and making a library and a place where people can study these books and rewrite English literary history with everybody in it. Truly, deeply a tantrum. That is never going to make a dime. Okay, I know that. Um, on the other hand, Ayrshire Farm is turning into a national chain. Urban Decay was just bought, this, this cracks me up. Uh, Urban Decay was just bought for $400 million by L'Oreal. Is that hilarious or what? I mean, this is for something that somebody told me nobody would ever buy this product. Um, and, you know, the Cisco very unfair thing. For a while, Cisco was the world's largest market cap company, which I also find hilarious. Um, it's now been replaced by, by Google, which I also find hilarious. I, I think if you're going to be in business, you have to laugh a lot. So without it, you have to drink a lot, and that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you, can't, you can't drink and be, and be in business. Um, another leading edge in a crowded marketplace. Um, there are some reasons not to go into some markets that are, I think, very good reasons. If you try to make 
another search engine or another spreadsheet program, immediately you're up against Google and Microsoft. That's just stupid. Okay, I mean, you'd have to be so much better and have access to a market entree and have money to wait about 20 years to get that product to market. So I think that's not a good idea. I personally wouldn't do it. Um, finding a new cancer drug or developing a new automobile takes horrific amounts of capital. So unless you're related to Bill Gates or somebody, the Sultan of Brunei, I think it's very difficult as a new business to go into an extremely capital intensive business, which is another name for a barrier to entry. All right. um, a girlfriend of mine was going to make another organic juice drink. <laughs> How many organic juice drinks does the world need? Um, there, and like with another pair of jeans, it's very, very hard to differentiate yourself. And you may think that it's really cool, and you may know that it's a lot better. But the market education and the amount of money to get people onto your side and to wait while the other people go out of business with their organic juice drinks or their jeans, or they become uncool, it takes a lot of money, and you will be spending a lot of money while you try to convince people in a very crowded marketplace, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm like better, I'm like better. Um, and you know, you may be, but I will also say that the best product does not win, always. That's, that, that there are so many times, Xerox, Xerox, perfect example, why the best product doesn't necessarily win. The people have heard of Xerox. Um, and the other thing is, in the military, if you're trying to go into some sort of very deep, dark, black, um, technical space and sell it to governments. I think A, it's very dangerous, but it's again very, very capital intensive. And that's a very hard, it's a very hard market to get into. And it's filled with really nasty people who by now have huge, huge amounts of money and they control whole governments. So I think that's, that classifies as another good barrier to entry. Um, we've talked about uh, social um, responsibility and Again, business is business, and business is profit. All right, Profit, I guess, is a dirty word, um, but not if you're going to be in business. And I would say that the best revenge, if you're really a socially responsible person, is be like Bill Gates, go make $79 billion, and then you can go do whatever socially responsible thing you want to it, like big time. And that's actually, um, that was, without knowing it, that's, that's how I ended up doing it. Um, cool ideas. Let's make a transporter. Okay. Yeah, that might be really cool. I want one. Len was supposed to make one like 30 years ago. Um, I'm still mad that he didn't. Uh, but it, it just isn't going to happen. Rocket ships go under that. Even Elon Musk aside, I still think making a rocket ship may be a cool idea. It's just not a business. Another thing that people do is they get themselves into such a segmented market like I want to open up a chain of restaurants serving biodynamic local vegan food from Bhutan. Does anybody know where Bhutan is? You know, it's about that big, right? And they have a growing season that's at least six hours long, right? So if you're going to serve biodynamic food from Bhutan, you probably don't have too many people, and you don't have any product. So you have how many people are looking for that food, and how much do you have to serve them? I see this all the time. You're, you're sniggering, but it, but it happens. And I would say that one of the worst things you can do is to go out with idea about, oh, I'm really cool and smart, and I just need some money. Just give me some money. Just give me some money. I don't need any infrastructure. I don't need a management team. I don't need any market research. I don't need a business plan. I really just need some money. Um, that I find deeply frightening. All right? um, nobody built their business alone. Nobody. Um, even Steve Jobs had Wozniak. Um, you know, Bill Gates had um, Paul Allen and, and a whole bunch of other people who ran that business. There were five of us who actually did Cisco. And I wouldn't say that we were a good management risk, basically. So anybody, when you look in here, it does take a team and it does take a lot of, a lot of people doing a lot of different parts of the business to actually make, make it succeed. And then there's the why no one has done this before. And one of the really bad things about capitalism is that it is a very adversarial system. Um, it's a competitive system. And 
there's no advantage to making it known that you tried something and it didn't work. All right, there really isn't. And I think the very sad part of that is in medical research. All the animals that get used and used and used and tortured again because all the companies have to keep trying things because nobody's going to tell somebody that they've already done you know, chemical X and it just did not work or it killed all the rats or something. So there's a whole lot of history lying there buried. And I think that the adage about, you know, if you don't know history, you're condemned to repeat it. People don't take enough time to learn the history of their particular idea or their market or their technology platform. This is especially true of people who think they're developing apps. I, you know, sorry, computer science started in the 30s. All right, you should really know something about that because it makes a difference if you can make a product that works across platforms and reliably and can handle success. All right, Google is brilliant. Google has handled success in a way that I don't think any other technology platform in my lifetime has ever been able to handle success. I don't know if anybody remembers Yahoo used to just get ground to a grinding halt when people started really using that service. Google, those people are smart. They have degrees like PhDs in computer science. They are really smart people, and they did a really good job, and they knew the history of what they were doing, and they had done a lot of work to make a better history and a better product, and not only do they have a very successful business, they have a huge barrier to entry. Okay, anybody here know, knows how Google works? Why it's better? You do. Okay, well, you know more than I do then. Um, you know, certainly they had a very, they, they sort of redefined how search worked and they redefined the way that you codify data structures. But behind all of that, there's a lot of just good science and they've done a great job. How many people writing an app to do this, that, or the other thing even understand what I just said? All right, so I think that knowing history is always your best defense and people do not take time in business to understand why a product hasn't been there, or if a product has been there. And I love this one, which says, experience is that which allows you to recognize your mistake as you make it again. I certainly resemble that. Um, make a business plan. I still make business plans, all right? I don't necessarily put numbers there, but I think you do need to really think about technical risk. Can you really make a product that works? Whether you're making roller skates, or you're making a computer or an app, there will be a technical risk. The market risk, okay? Somebody else gonna eat your market? A big company gonna eat your market and roll over you and not even know it did it? Uh, that's happened to me a couple of times. Um, or at least there was a threat there. A management risk is probably the biggest thing that you guys haven't thought about. If you succeed, what does your management team look like? What does your strategy look like? Where, where's your strategic plan? Who's that coming from? Where's your CFO? What's your, what's your operation look like and who's running that? Um, at Cisco, I was simultaneously running um, all of manufacturing, all of in-house test, test and repair, inside sales, customer service, um, and RMA, uh, and all of the financial and accounting part of the company. Okay, this is called not having a management strategy. <laughs> Trust me. Um, so I think that if you understand more about management risk and get people around you to help you deal with that management risk of pulling together a good team who understand the product and who are willing to work with you and willing to put in the kind of time, you definitely are more poised for success than if you don't. And then there's always investor risk. Um, I personally think the right money to take is none. If I had it all to do over again, Cisco self-financed itself for three years. I don't know if anybody knows that here, but we were actually making, we were bringing in a quarter of a million dollars a month just selling over the internet when selling over the internet was illegal. Um, we had no salesmen, um, had a couple of my friends who were on the phone, um, you know, and we would get an order and everybody would clap their hands and run around and then we would go make it and then we would go send it out. Um, and then we got some money. And the reason why we got some money was that we were bidding on contracts that there was no way we had the capital to finance. Even at wholesale prices, we could not if we had gotten some of the contracts, we could not have afforded to build them, would have bankrupted the company. And so we ended up taking money. Um, 
and that has a whole different kind of set of issues with it. Um, I still think it's better to be your own boss, and I've been fired, and I am not going to be in a position to have that happen again. And if it's not your money, um, it's not your decision. I think a good idea stands the test of time. I actually have two good ideas that I have not had time to do, and in 10 years, they're still good ideas. I think tomorrow I can make a business, and I can make a successful business. A good idea, you should stand in that closet or go back there for a while and let it cool off. A good idea will still be a good idea months or even years down the road. I think that a good business idea has some intellectual property. And this is what makes me nuts about, oh, I wrote this really cool app. Um, <coughs> Nine-year-olds can write apps. Maybe probably at this point, seven-year-olds can write apps. Where's the intellectual property? A great example was Urban Decay had no intellectual property. We had three weeks from the time that we put a product on the shelf to where it would be knocked off. You can't patent color. All of the materials, it's a very turnkey operation. If anybody wants to make makeup, you can have it in the shelf in two months. I can tell you how. I could probably even get it down to a month with the right incentive. Very turnkey, but that just means that everybody is getting their stuff made at the same place by the same people and they have absolutely no regard for your intellectual property. So if somebody says, oh, I, I want to make Uzi nail polish, and they go, okay. I mean, we've been offered every product on the marketplace when you go out there. So there needs to be some intellectual property, and I think that's where companies like Google have really, really got an edge. It's very hard for somebody to come up with something that's going to beat Google. The management at Cisco still doesn't understand the fundamental core of that product which is patented. Um, Len holds a patent. Um, so I think it's really good to have something that at least has some sort of intellectual property patent, or it's just so damn hard, and that was Cisco originally, it was just so damn hard that it was going to be very unlikely, or at least take long enough for somebody in Taiwan to reverse engineer it, that you could go and get market share before they could do it. And that's called barrier to entry. And personally, I don't invest in any business that doesn't have a pretty good wallop on a barrier to entry, because if you can do it, so can anybody else with two arms. And so I think the thing is, is to get something that, that's, if it won't, if it can't have patent protection, and we all know with the Pacific Rim what good that does, um, if it's, if it just has, if, if there's some kernel of an idea that's embedded in there that is so off the wall or requires such intelligence, and, and I have to say that the thing about the Cisco product it was both way off the wall, and it was really intelligent. It actually relied on some mathematics that had been done in the 1930s that Len Bosak, who's like one of the top mathematicians in, in the universe, he just knew that, and nobody else knew it. So they were doing like really hard, expensive things. And he says, no, no, you can, we can do it this really easy, cheap way. And that was the fundamental part of that. Now, I don't know if you could find six people in Sweden who, if you explained what that was, it was a bit of, bit of sparse matrix technology that, that Len actually solved. So there was a barrier to entry. You don't have to get all into the, the nuts and bolts of the mathematics, but nobody was expecting anybody to do that, which is in itself a barrier to entry. And by the time you got it reduced to what the thing was actually doing, it was really hard to figure out. And at the fundamental <coughs> bottom of that was a patent. So that's a barrier to entry. If you don't have that, you have to go, like Urban Decay, you got three weeks three weeks to get your product out, do all of your marketing, educate your market, get everything sold, and be ready with the next product in three weeks. Do you want to live like that? I can tell you that is a rotten business. After six months, it was so not fun anymore. So I think if you have to pick, unless you really, really want this neurosis of like every three weeks completely redefining your product space, um, it's better to have some, some barrier to entry. And with every business, there will be risk. And how many of you have thought about your exit strategy? You may not want to be doing this for the rest of your life. Some things have no exit strategy. Farming, farming has no exit strategy. Um, so I would think about the fact that in any capitalist system, risk and reward are, are so close as to almost be the same thing. And start thinking about how you're going to get out. And here again is this idea about lying to yourself. If all of you fantasize that Google 
or Cisco or Apple or somebody is going to come along and want to buy your thing, do you have any idea how many things they are sold or tried to be sold every day? Thousands. Thousands. So again, then you get back to, oh, me, me, I'm different. Uh-huh, right? Um, so think about all of that, I think, before you really decide that it's a really good idea. And also, I think many people who are doing this don't really think about how much they are going to have to personally do to make it happen. The market isn't waiting for you. And on top of that, you have to, talk, you have to do it on time and on budget. Now, Len has been working on a new router to replace the Cisco router. Not at Cisco. He has his own company, which he's had 1990. Um, and they've sold three since 1990. And it doesn't work yet. Um, and he didn't come with me because he had to leave because it wasn't working yet. If he didn't stay there, they might not get a product out this year. But I don't know why this is different because since 1990, that's 26 years, right? Is that right? Or have I got it? Am I missing that? 26 years. Um, so when you think about that, the market hasn't waited. By the time he gets out, the market's someplace else. He gets out with a product. Oh, hell. Back to the drawing board. And he has no exit strategy, and he's 64 years old, and he's still doing it. Fortunately, Len really likes that sandbox, which is really what it is. All right, it's, you know, Elon Musk has a rocket ship. Len has a bunch of people he sits around and plays with, with dark fiber as long as you don't think it's a business, all right? Um, my farm makes more money in one year as a farm, at least on a gross basis, than Len has made in nearly 30. Why is that? The market doesn't wait for you. And as any engineer knows, you can't release it unless it's, it's perfect. And that was my job at Cisco, to lever things out of the engineering department that weren't perfect. And boy, I tell you, that is a tough job. That is such a tough job, and it's why I got fired. The engineering department didn't, right? Um, so I just wanted you guys to be able to think about this stuff. Um, and at the very end, I will give you some good news. The big boys do make mistakes. I'm watching one right now in the US, and I am just laughing myself silly that you guys don't have the problem here. But you, you, thanks, to the, thanks to the European um, government, you just got genetically modified ingredients. They're just a bad idea. <laughs> they really are. You know, hey, let's ruin that food system from the microbes on up. Um, the big boys have missed the market on that one. GMOs in the US are crashing. Okay, that whole thing is just falling apart. The big boys and girls, actually it was girl, Estee Lauder, missed the makeup call. People did want blue makeup. They wanted different makeup. They wanted expressive makeup, you know. Um, they missed that market. Um, Cisco, we tried to give that business to a number of companies, including 3Com, Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard could have had Cisco for a quarter million dollars in, in 1986. A quarter million dollars would have bought Hewlett Packard Cisco systems. They didn't want it. So the big boys can make a mistake. And you just have to go through, I think, this really hard soul searching, not lying to yourself eraser exercise and just believe in yourself enough to believe that there's really a good reason why no one has done this. And there are businesses out there. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely living proof that the people who should know better don't. And I think that the big thing you have to really come to grips with as what is usually called these days entrepreneur, which I loathe that word. I'm an industrialist. I'm not an entrepreneur, um, is that you may care, and you may know all about your product, and you may know all about your market, and you may know all of the reasons why this is going to be the, you know, the next Google or the next sliced bread. Nobody else does. Not only does nobody else not know it, they don't care. And so somehow, you have to be prepared to put in the time and the money and have the market time <coughs> and the clock ticking, and everything lined up, your management strategy, your investor strategy, all of that stuff in place to wait that out until that market gets to where you are, or you've managed to build that market. And I think if I had to say that one thing that I see that people over and over and over again, they read their own sales literature, and they believe it, and nobody else out there has a clue. 
So selling to yourself has never been a terribly, <laughs> terribly effective strategy. And um, the recipe is for success. Everybody wants to know how I did it. Actually, what everybody wants to know is how to be really rich. And I've always said it's half working smarter, half working harder, and half being just absolutely flat lucky. I can tell you 12 different stories why Cisco should not exist. I can tell you half as many stories why urban decay should not exist. I could talk until your ears fall off about why the farm should not exist. But at some point, it's better to be lucky than smart, as Napoleon said. And it just, you just have to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, there's, I haven't found a substitute for that, but although, as Edison did say, fortune smiles on the prepared mind. So I think you can help yourself in that direction, but you know, at the end of the day, I think you can be all teed up, but you've got to be at the right place at the right time. And I think that's, oh, I have one more slide. Because I get to say something to you guys, because I'm up here in the chair and I have the microphone. Um, the thing I am proudest about, and everybody says, oh, you know, isn't it really cool that like you've created these big companies? And the answer is no. What I'm really proudest about, and people have lost sight of this in every country in the world, only primary industry creates wealth. Anybody know what primary industry is? Nobody knows economics, macroeconomics 101 anymore. Primary industry creates wealth. It's agriculture, manufacturing, and mining. And why is that? Because it takes something that has little or no value, like in agriculture it's dirt, and a couple of seeds, and it adds value, huge value that wouldn't be there except for that process of farming. And that's new money. Manufacturing, you take things that individually, like a couple of bolts or a sheet of, of, of metal, a piece of plastic that has no value, you manufacture them, you put them together, you create a product that is more than the sum of its parts in terms of its value. That's new money. And mining, you got a rock. It's a rock worth. Well, a piece of steel is worth a lot more money than a rock. That's added value and that's new money. What people don't think about is they go into these things and everybody wants everybody to live well, especially in Europe and the socially responsible people. Unless you're actually creating wealth, you're just taking that money from somebody else. It's just, it's, it's just the law. Does it make any sense? If you're not creating new wealth, you are redistributing wealth. Secondary industry, which is infrastructure, communications, um, distribution, Secondary industry, tertiary industry, the service industry, lawyers. They just move money around. The banks, banks the tertiary industry, they do absolutely nothing for the economy that's positive, in my view. So if you want to do something really socially responsible, and you really, really want to do something that contributes to the betterment, and I'm sure you guys all do. I mean, it's a nice thing about being in Europe and Sweden in particular. You know, everybody's really, really into, into being good people. You have to create new money. If you don't want to make somebody poorer because you get richer, there's only one way to do it, and that's primary industry. And I just heard something really interesting on the BBC a couple days ago where um, Google, um, Google has now eclipsed Apple as being the biggest market cap in the world. And the guy said something really interesting. He goes, you know, the, the interviewer is saying, well, you know, how do you compare these companies? You know, why, why is one worth more than the other? And the guy says, we can't really. Um, you know, Apple makes something. They're a manufacturer. But Google just provides a service. But then he didn't say anything more about that. I think a lot of people on the radio kind of went, yeah, and? And the answer is, one is creating wealth, permanent, durable, additional wealth in society, and moving that society in a way that that wealth allows, which is infrastructure, schools, you know, basically bettering lives. You know, Google's a great company. I think those guys are smarter than heck. Boy, I wish I'd have done that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a service. And it's not creating wealth. And yet all of that wealth has come from somewhere. It has not come from that genesis of, of that business. So I just want to put in a plug for primary industry. Thank you. You're the one who's going to answer the questions. 
So thank you so much. That was interesting. Uh, one thing that I would like to ask to start with uh, is um, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, timing. Because it seems like you have had uh, good knowledge or a feel for a good timing during your life and your career. You don't really talk about timing, but the, the cosmetic, uh, the Urban Decay, that, that was before, but right on spot when the market was actually looking for something new, and the same with Cisco, and now into the, 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 the more bio-organic um, fast food chain. It seems like that is right on spot on time as well. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a bit of an advantage, and I don't want to say that there's no room here for individual achievement, because there is. I kind of grew up in a war zone, and I just, Len says that I'm like the Greek, um, the Greek fable about Cassandra. She had the gift of seeing into the future, but her punishment that nobody would believe her. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I can see very early where trends in the marketplace are, and I can watch things really subliminally, kind of just little tiny things on the side, and I know way ahead of time, and then nobody will believe me. This keeps happening again and again. I've been farming for 20 years, so 20 years ago. Another interesting thing about the library, the library in England, I started in 1992, and who had who had thought about feminist studies or gender studies or women's studies in 1992? And now we have this great library and people are actually getting degrees in this. So I think there is a lot to timing and I'm just assuming that if you guys are gonna succeed, um, the market waits for no person and either you've gotta be really well funded, really well organized, or really ahead of the game. It just comes down to those three things. So do we have any questions? Uh, yeah. uh, what trends do you actually see now going forward? What trends? Okay, yeah. so here's someone who wants to pick your brain. <laughs> um, you know, I have a couple of ideas for businesses that I wish I could find somebody just to execute. All right, I have money. I have business. I just I have this idea to just do these things. I can't find anybody who actually wants to work. But if I were going to go make another pile of money, like a big pile of money, like a Google pile of money or a Cisco pile of money the trends, it's computer security. And you're gonna to have to know something because right now we're in a position that the governments will not solve the problem because the vested corporate interests don't want the problem solved. For moving money, securing data, the, the, the big governments in the world have too much money invested in the free flow of information to bad people. And I think that if you really wanna make you know, an Elon Musk pile of money, a really huge one, um, there are going to be, there, somebody will come up with a, a data security, transmission security protocol that will make such a difference that it will embarrass the governments into adopting it. Which I have to tell you was TCPIP came exactly that same way, embarrass the government into adopting it. So that can happen. Um, other trends, um, you know, I'm, I'm so non pop culture. I'm like, I'm, I'm so really, really out of it. I mean, obviously, I think green business, but is that a trend? I mean, that's, anybody knows that these days. Um, I, I guess my, my biggest wad would just be, um, I also think there's a big market in education and in making education much less expensive because I think you can do that now with technology um, in a way that wasn't before. But you know, I, I'm, I'm not really about education. But it just seems like there's a whole lot of tools there that people haven't really exploited. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, talk about timing. What about being ahead of your time? Uh, should you wait or prepare? Or like, how do you know if you're, like you can be too late to a trend? Absolutely you can, and I can tell you it's really expensive, but to me it's a lot like, when was the last time you had your, home your homework done too far in advance? <laughs> All right. And with Cisco, we couldn't even sell routers to people who were making bridges. I mean, 3Com didn't know, uh, this great talk with Judy Estrin, one of the founders of Bridge Communications, she goes, why would anybody want an internet? I mean, I don't know how many people, I've, 
other than the generals in the US Army, they're the only people who didn't ask, why would I want an internet? And that's because they made the internet. You know, DARPA, ARPA was, was, was their, I mean, they understood the need for communication. BT didn't. I sat in front of a whole bunch of people in British Telecom. They go, why do we need an internet? Um, so you can be in front, but I will say that if you can hang on, and it gives you a lot of time to develop that collateral, that sales collateral, you will screw up. So it's good not to have a market that's breathing down your neck sometimes, especially if you have a very complicated product to sell, because those sales cycles are very long. And you will screw up, believe me. Um, you will not have the right material at the right time for the right person, presented in the right way. You have to go up, especially if you have an expensive product like a network or an internet network, you have to go up chains of command where people really don't want to listen to you or don't want to understand like they're making six or seven figures a year and they can't understand you and they hate that okay but they're certainly not going to take the time to learn it and understand you so I think it's it's a good time to take your lumps it's a good time to make sure that you're really you're really ready to go and then when the market's there hey you've already got the product you've debugged it you've you know you've got a ready market you've got people that you've sold to you've got really good documentation you've got all that stuff but then, of course, the magic word is hang on, and that's, of course, why Cisco went three years and we had to take money. We were, we were way ahead. I and mean, we came from the university, right? In 1980s, Stanford was the world's largest local area network. There were 5,000 computers on that local area network. Um, nothing else looked like that, or at least nothing else knew that it looked like that. So yes, you can be too early, but you know, I've been farming for 20 years. People, when I moved to Virginia, couldn't <laughs> spell organic. You know, I was from California. I was obviously just completely deranged. I, you know, just, nobody. I obviously had two heads and like, you know, I don't know, ate frogs for dinner. Um, so yes, you can be early, but think about the number of people now who are trying to enter that organic marketplace. Okay, I've got 1,200 certified organic cows and I've got 600 certified organic pigs, and I've got a brand that's established. So yeah, it's been a real expensive road. Cisco was a real expensive road, but then we were there and everybody else was just kind of looking around trying to piece it all together really fast, which you can do. The right management, the right funding, if you're really smart, you're really willing to work that hard. But there are some things that are really hard, I think, that just have a huge educational ramp, not only for the marketplace, but for the company. At Cisco once, the head of software engineering had a big tantrum and he said, if you can't read the manual, you shouldn't be allowed to buy a gateway. An interesting market subsetting, if you can't read the manual, you shouldn't be, we shouldn't take your money. Uh, you know, at that point we decided to send the manual to a professional manual, you know, documentation creator, which was a really good move, and get it out of software engineering. Um, so again, yeah, timing, timing is good, but I always like having my homework done way before anybody else does. And it also gets you, you're a little bit, you can screw up more or other people can do terrible things to you and you're not caught with your pants down. If you've already got it, if, if you've got it most of the way done, you've, you've got a little bit of, of time to mess up for one reason or another. So good and bad. Uh, sounds quite expensive. Just takes money. <laughs> yeah. But you know, as I say, any problem you can solve with money isn't a real problem. Mm -hmm. So how many people in here are entrepreneurs today, this morning? Do we have a lot of you? Yeah, some. Okay. Maybe half? How many of you are industrialists? Yes. I was going to come to this now because you, uh, you actually asked me before not to introduce you as an entrepreneur, which I would have if I just read, you know, by reading your bio. But you were just like, no, I'm not an entrepreneur. So I would really like to just know how you look at entrepreneurship and contra in, you, you call yourself an industrialist because you make things. Can you talk you know, about I, that? This whole entrepreneur thing yeah. to me has been so overused that it applies to anybody who's trying to get out of having a real job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't want to work for anybody and I don't want to like put on the clothes and like go to work like five days a week and put up with, you know, a miserable boss. So I'm going to be an entrepreneur. No, I'm sorry. You know, you can't be a rock star. I think, you know, Robert Smith of The Cure said, well, I wasn't going to go get a job. Um, I don't know if business you can really... And Robert Smith is very talented. Um, you know, I don't know if business kind of works that way, but I think the people that I know that are entrepreneurs are very hardworking, and they aren't really thinking about the things that you think about when you say that word. 
thinking about people who are completely subsuming their life, their family, their everything else, and are just so focused on one thing for the sake of the success of that thing. It's not the success of themselves or the success of the business. It's they love the thing so much. And that was Cisco and the network. That was me and the nail polish. It's certainly me and my food. Mm. You love it so much that that's, that's where you are. You're not, you're not in this other space about you know, trying to find a place in the marketplace. You're about what you're doing and kind of the rest of the world just melts away. I guess you're ahead uh, in the States today because there is a, there's been a, quite a big hype around startups and entrepreneurships for a while and we are a little bit, um, not so far, we're not there yet. So I think you have that American perspective on, on the entrepreneurship and the startups, maybe. Yeah, I think it's just, it's very different starting a business in, as I was saying to Mesa, um, it's very different being in business in the States than it is in Europe. It's just, it's hugely different. Um, we don't have these little, um, and I don't mean this pejoratively, we don't have these incubators. I mean, in America, it really is a piranha bath. Um, but it's also in America, people don't have the expectations of, I think, the comfort that you all have in Europe. You know, you're going to work 30 hours a week, or, you know, you have these really nice things that the government provides for you. And in America, um, although I'm very proud now, finally, we have a health care system. Thank you, God. Thank you, President Obama. I don't have to apologize for that anymore. We've, we've now gotten into the middle of the 20th century. Um, for business, it's very different in that the people who come along with you in your business don't have the expectation of a 30-hour work week and taking vacations and all this stuff paid for. Um, people, I think, work very hard in America. And as I was saying to my cousins, when we have such bad politicians, I don't think it matters because the people of America were immigrants, were people who left, were people who had a lot of, I think, individual initiative and would take risks and were very hard working. Certainly my Swedish ancestors just, I've got a great work ethic and that's where I got it. Um, I don't really see that in Europe as much. And I think we can have a really terrible government because the people are what the people are and the government can just be really terrible, which of course it has been up until the last few years. We know what side I'm on. Um, but nothing gets in, in the way of that drive and that focus and that sacrifice. In Europe, it's, it's much, much different. I know when Cisco went to go open up a European sales office, it was... It was a real wake up. You know, the secretary got a Mercedes and you know, nobody came to work on Monday. Um, and that was, that was very hard, I think, for us to deal with. So I don't know that we're ahead particularly. I think you guys have these incubation places that I just, they just don't exist. I mean, if you want to talk about incubation in the US, it's MIT, it's Stanford, it's Carnegie Mellon. I mean, it's, it's where the technology comes from. It's where Google came from, it's where Cisco came from. I mean, it's where Microsoft, Microsoft came from MIT. Um, Bill didn't, but Microsoft did. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very different, but I think for entrepreneurs in the old sense, the people who are taking the risk, who are going first, you know, on trade, um, it's, it's a better environment for a company. And a lot of my Swedish friends, I think, would agree with me. Do we have any more questions? One last one, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Um, you talked a bit about uh, your role at Cisco is to kind of squeeze the product out of the tech departments. Um, and I know here in Sweden we have a lot of really talented engineers and a lot of world class technologies. Um, but as a salesperson on the software side or trying to get products out to market, what's the secret or what's kind of advice that you have on, on that process? Um, did everybody hear the question? Did you hear it? Yeah. 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 How, to get, how, how to get things out of engineering. Yeah. Engineering will not release something unless it's perfect and only God is perfect. Um, and from my side, I couldn't sell another one. You know, hey, if you can't sell an improvement, I mean, if it's perfect, there are no improvements, right? Um, I think there were a couple of things about it that make it a really horrific job, and I don't think that there's any other way to put it. It's just a horrific job. Part of it was that I was a young woman, and women do not know how to play in business very well. Uh, women, women tend to be collaborative, and business is 
very much a cooperative sport, and those are very, very different things. And I think I got doubly nailed because I didn't understand that at the time. And mostly my way of doing it was just to take lumps. And, you know, I was not a technical player at Cisco, although I do have a graduate degree in mathematics and another one in computer science. And at Cisco, I was not on the engineering side. So I did have enough knowledge and enough weight to go in and just grab the damn thing. And I did. Um, and I remember one time Len looking at me and I said, the customer who at this point was Boeing. All right, we're not talking about like a small customer, we're talking about like Boeing. He, you know, I said, Boeing needs you to put this into the software. We have to have this for Boeing. And Len looked at me and said, well, they're allowed not to like the atomic weight of hydrogen, but there's not much they can do about it. <laughs> if you had to describe my life at Cisco in one, in one exchange, that was my life at Cisco. And I got fired, all right? And yet, Mortgage says, I'm the reason the company succeeded. Okay, I get fired. I'm the one who gets told about atomic weight of hydrogen. And at the end of the day, I get fired. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think there's a, there's a good job there. I think you, um, you have to be just, I, you know, I, I don't want to use a swear word here. I'm trying to think of some really non-offensive word to say, but you just have to stand there and just, the British have a good term. They say bloody-minded. I, I could understand when they were trying to BS me because I've got a degree in computer science. I speak all of that. I've done all of those things. I knew when they were trying to give me a raft of hooey about why I couldn't have it. And I was also smart enough to go take it and box it up and test it and make it work and send it out the door. And they came in the next morning at noon and it was gone and tough beans. And I was also enough of a... It, Len and I have been called... I'm, I'm the... Era, I'm the irresistible force, he's the immovable object. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you that it's fun, I can't tell you that it's a good way to go through life, but somebody's got to do it. And I can also, I think it's pretty generally agreed that because I am not at Len's company, he does not have anything out the door. All right, it's still perfect, and 26 years later, it's still not perfect, and he's still sliding down the cutting edge, and he's still reading the data manuals, and darn it, those ICs are still not performing like the people who make them say that they do. I mean, I have definitely heard this before. I've got the t-shirt. It's not a way to have a good life. But in the end, you have to do it, you know, or else how do you sell, how do you sell the second one? Right? I mean, I've been in tears. I had, I had a vice president, Hewlett Packard, call me at 2 o'clock in the morning and threaten to cancel their order. And I was actually crying because I could not get the box out of engineering. And he did not care. And he really did not care that I was a girl on the other end of the phone and I was crying because I could not get a box out of engineering. All right, so, I don't know, what's the answer? Just You know be, what's ahead of you, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> be tough. That's why my voice is yeah. low. So we have to wrap up. Uh, really, my side, you have some uh, yeah. One big thanks to you, Saudi, no, for coming here. Person, but we have uh, local coffee. Oh, well, thank you. Like, just as a thank you for your time. Yeah, today. it's roasted here right beside. I was going to say you grow, you grow coffee in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Secretly. You're better farmers than I am. Uh, no, it's roasted here. Uh, so thank you. Very big thank you. Uh, and coming here and sharing all this to, to everybody here. Uh, and I hope they'll see you back. We will always post all the events uh, on our Facebook page, mostly. Uh, so keep looking what's coming next. And thank you so much, Nandi. Thank you. Thank you.